Hello and welcome to a Minecraft video. I'm Scudobuyo playing Vanilla Minecraft 1.8.4 PC Edition and this is the first in a series of videos in which I conquer an ocean monument. Uh, that's one of these underwater structures here introduced in the 1.8 update. Uh, this video is just going to be an overview of the strategy and a discussion of the material requirements. If you're looking for a part of the strategy in action, a link to the other videos in this series can be found in the description. Uh, the strategy that I'll be using is a comprehensive early game strategy suitable for any difficulty level. It's a comprehensive strategy in the sense that not only will I be killing the Elder Guardians and extracting the treasure, but I'll also be draining the water both from inside the monument and from above the monument. Basically, I want the monument itself. Maybe I'll use it as a base, or I'll turn it into an experience farm, I'm not, I'm not sure yet. But I want the whole monument, and I want it exposed and intact. Uh, the strategy is an early game strategy in the sense that it requires no enchantments and no potions. Uh, it also requires no materials that can be obtained only from uncommon biomes, from the nether, as loot, or by trading and it requires only a minimum of harder to obtain materials. And the strategy is suitable for any difficulty level in the sense that the difficulty level is largely irrelevant. I won't be dealing with any mob spawning other than guardians and I will be avoiding direct combat with the guardians whenever possible. The project has four distinct phases. Uh, first I'm going to kill the elder guardians. Then I'm going to build a Swiss cheese cover of leaves and stone over the entire monument. Then I'm going to remove the water from inside the monument. And then I will be removing the water from above the monument. The order of these phases is crucial. Uh, in particular, the cover needs to be built after the Elder Guardians have been eliminated, uh, but before draining the water from inside the monument. And that's because guardians are less likely to spawn in a column of water that has a view of the sky. Before the cover is in place, most of the columns of water above the monument have a view of the sky. Uh, so disproportionately fewer guardians will spawn outside the monument, which makes it a bit safer to kill the elder guardians, because I'll reach them from the outside by punching holes in the exterior of the monument. However, building the cover changes the balance of where the guardians spawn. After the cover is in place, most guardians will spawn above the monument due to the fact that there's more water outside than inside. This significantly reduces the number of guardians that spawn inside the monument, making it much safer to remove the water from inside. The order of the steps within each phase is also important. When I kill the elder guardians, I'll start by killing the two in the lower wings of the monument, uh, and then I'll use the sponges they drop to more easily reach the one in the penthouse at the top. When I drain the water from inside the monument, I'll start by draining the water from the penthouse, uh, now using the sponges from all three Elder Guardians. Uh, and then from there, I will search for a sponge room in order to increase my inventory of sponges uh, before I remove the water from the rest of the interior. Now, finding a sponge room is really a linchpin of the strategy, unfortunately. It's uncommon for an ocean monument to generate without a sponge room, but it's not rare. I know that this particular monument has a sponge room because I scouted it in spectator mode for the purpose of making these videos. Uh, but if you're using a, this strategy to conquer an ocean monument in your own world, you'll need to find a sponge room or you'll need sponges from another monument. It is possible to continue using only the three sponges from the Elder Guardians, but it would be painfully slow and I wouldn't recommend it. Alright, in order to drain the water from above the monument, I'll first be dumping sand over the Swiss cheese cover that I made in the second phase there. Uh, I'll be dumping it over the edges and into the holes, and this will create a temporary retaining wall in order to hold back the surrounding ocean. Uh, and it will also divide the water above the monument into smaller vertical water tanks. Uh, now, the amount of sand that needs to be dumped is immense. Uh, I've mitigated this by developing a procedure that greatly reduces the total amount of sand I'll need for the project. 
essentially uh, the steps of the fourth phase here uh, will be done incrementally. And, and that will allow me to reclaim and reuse sand. Uh, and because dumping sand is really boring, I've also designed two sand pushing machines that will allow me to AFK nearly all of the dumping uh, at the expense of having to dig eight to nine blocks of sand for each stack dumped. Uh, with the necessary sand in place, I'll drain each water tank individually. And after the adjacent water tanks have been drained, uh, I'll replace the temporary retaining wall with a perimeter that keeps the surrounding ocean from flowing back in. Uh, I specifically use the term perimeter here rather than wall because I won't be building a permanent wall. Instead, I'll be making a big square-shaped hole in the ocean. The required raw materials reflect this fourth phase by including three double chests of sand. Uh, I'm cheating here with respect to my representation of sand, but what I mean is three double chests. Uh, the precise amount of sand required will vary according to the terrain underneath the monument. In the extreme case, uh, for example, if the ocean is really deep uh, all around the monument, I may need as much as a fourth double chest of sand. I'll see how much of the project I can complete with only three, and I'll gather more when the time comes. Uh, but even four double chests of sand isn't actually so bad. Uh, that amount can be gathered from islands and beaches without too much trouble, so hunting for a desert shouldn't be necessary. Uh, the raw materials also includes nine stacks of cobblestone and eight stacks of wood. Uh, this is actually a bit more wood than is represented in the project materials over here, even including the chests that are holding everything, uh, but I'm sure I'll find a use for it. Uh, the wood is separated like this into six and a half stacks here and one and a half stacks over here, uh, and that's because one and a half stacks should be oak, uh, but the rest can be anything. And I'll talk more about why I need oak wood when I go over the project materials. Uh, besides the wood, I will need three and a half stacks of leaves from any kind of tree. Uh, this is three and a half stacks rather than four because it's already more than I'll need. And three and a half stacks can be gathered using a single pair of shears, whereas four stacks can't. Uh, three stacks of sugar canes and a stack of pumpkins round out the cost of common raw materials. And as for the less common raw materials, uh, well, it's, it's not really a raw material per se, but I'll need a cow to milk. Uh, if everything goes well, I'll have to milk the cow only once. If everything doesn't go well, I'll have to milk the cow a second time, but no more than that. So I'll need to know where I can find a cow, um, but it's not really necessary for it to be nearby. Uh, luckily, some cows spawned along this peninsula over here, so uh, I won't have to go far. Uh, besides the cow, uh, the raw materials include 80 gunpowder, a single piece of flint, and less than a half stack each of iron and redstone, and uh, finally three lava source blocks. Um, I, I know that these are lava buckets, but I've included the cost of the buckets with the iron ingots up here, uh, so what I really mean are, are lava source blocks. Not included in the raw materials are the tools I'd need to gather all this stuff in the first place. Uh, for example, I would expend a pair of shears in order to gather all the leaf blocks here, uh, but I didn't include two iron ingots for that initial pair of shears uh, in the raw material cost over here. Uh, I should note that these requirements could be reduced even a bit further, uh, but doing so would complicate a process or otherwise require additional time or labor. Uh, instead, I think this represents a good balance of cost and convenience, uh, and really it's not very expensive given the scale of the project. The project materials are derived from the raw materials, uh, trivially so in the case of sand. Uh, I have here um, the nearly the three double chests from the raw materials, uh, though one stack was sacrificed while crafting. I also have about eight stacks of cobblestone and a stack of cobblestone slabs. 
the eighth stack of cobblestone is a partial stack just because that's what was left from the raw materials but it's still a bit more than I'll need. Uh, a few of the wood planks here will be consumed as furnace fuel and the rest will be used to build the sand pushers. Um, I, I could use any opaque block to build the sand pushers but I'll be using wood planks because they're visually distinct from stone and cobblestone which makes the machines easier to tear down. Uh, any kind of wood planks will work but it's probably best to avoid birch because the coloring is too similar to sand. Uh, the ladders will be used for climbing of course but I'll also be using them as a standard underwater tool. Ladders are good for underwater use because they're not broken by flowing water. Uh, they can be placed on the side of a block without anything underneath. Uh, and of course, they're a partial block, uh, which means they create an air pocket that I can, can use to replenish my air meter. Uh, other blocks with similar utility include uh, trapdoors, signs, and banners. Um, each of them has its strengths and weaknesses, but banners deserve a special mention because they're a bit of a disappointment. Uh, both floor-mounted banners and wall-mounted banners render as two blocks high, uh, but a floor-mounted banner occupies only the bottom block, uh, whereas a wall-mounted banner occupies only the top block. Um, I can even place blocks in the deceptively empty spaces here. It looks kind of weird. Uh, and that means that uh, if I were to place a banner underwater, uh, it would only displace one block of water, uh, and the rest of the banner would just serve to obstruct my view. Doors, on the other hand, are two blocks high, and they are perfect for underwater use. Uh, they're going to be my go-to underwater utility, which is why I have three stacks of them. Like ladders, uh, doors aren't broken by flowing water. Uh, they're also a partial block, so they create a two block high pocket of air in which I can fully stand. Uh, doors can be open and closed, of course, uh, which means that when I place a door, I can effectively remove it without having to break it, uh, which is useful while the Elder Guardians are afflicting me with mining fatigue. Uh, now, I will be using oak doors specifically, and the reason why I need oak doors is because they have these nice transparent panes here, uh, which allow me to see through them without even having to open the door. In the default resource pack, there are only three kinds of wooden doors that have transparent panes. Uh, so that eliminates spruce doors, birch doors, and dark oak doors. Uh, and because I'm not using materials specific to uncommon biomes, uh, that eliminates jungle doors and acacia doors, uh, which just leaves oak doors, and that's why the raw material requirements included one and a half stacks of oak wood. Uh, doors also have one more unusual property. Uh, they can be placed even when their collision mask intersects with the collision mask of a player or a mob. Uh, here I'm, I'm actually inside the door. You can see the outline of its hitbox all around me there. Um, I can open the door. I can close it so I'm back inside it. Um, I can even break it. Uh, but if I try to step outside the door, uh, I can't step just step back inside, and that's because doors really are a solid block. Um, th there are only two other solid blocks that allow you to place them uh, when their collision mask would intersect yours, and, and those are beds and lily pads, but I'm not going to be using either of those. Uh, I will be using this unusual property on a couple of occasions, uh, but for the most part, it just means that I don't have to worry as much about guardians being in the way when I'm trying to place a door. Okay, I also have a few boats. Uh, one will be left adrift, uh, another will probably be consumed by lava, um, and it's always good to have a couple of spares. Uh, there is one trick with boats that I don't intend to use, but it can be handy in a pinch. Let's say that you're stuck inside an ocean monument, your water breathing is running low, and you're still afflicted with mining fatigue. Uh, and you've gotten completely turned around and it feels like there's just no way you're going to get out. A boat can be used as a kind of emergency exit. Uh, it turns out that boats can be placed underwater. Uh, the boat will appear above you and it will continue to float upwards until it reaches the surface of the water 
uh, or until it's blocked by an obstruction. Uh, while the boat is underwater, you can still ride inside it. Uh, you'll take suffocation damage, but if you then quickly exit, uh, you'll be placed over the boat inside the obstruction. Uh, and uh, if the obstruction is only a single block thick, uh, you can just jump out, having phased through whatever ceiling is trapping the boat. All right, uh, three and a half stacks of leaves from any kind of tree. Um, the leaves will be used as a kind of marker when building the cover. Uh, like wooden planks, they're also visually distinct from stone and cobblestone. Uh, plus, they can be broken extremely quickly using a pair of shears, so they'll be easy to remove while leaving the rest of the cover in place. Uh, sugar canes here are also an excellent underwater tool. They'll actually be doing double duty as a screen from guardian attacks and as a water break. Sugar canes are completely non-solid. Uh, they have no collision mask, so I can stand in the same block as the sugar canes, even as I place them. Uh, and even though they're non-solid, uh, sugar canes occupy nearly a full block. Uh, you can see that there's not a whole lot of room there, uh, which means that when I'm standing in the same blocks as two, two high tall sugar canes, I'm basically standing entirely within the plant. Uh, Anywhere over the middle 16 pixels of, uh, it seems to be okay. Um, that's two pixels to either side of center, uh, which is a reasonable amount of leeway. Uh, and standing inside sugar canes not only will prevent guardians from targeting me, uh, it will instantly break off the attack of any guardian that's already targeting me. Uh, so fish stick over there uh, can't see me because I'm standing inside the sugar canes. Uh, and if I get rid of them, there we go. It instantly breaks off the attack once I replace them. Uh, sugar canes don't need any light whatsoever. Uh, and because they are one of the only plants that are not broken by flowing water, they can even be placed underwater. Uh, that makes sugar canes nearly ideal. Uh, the weakness of sugar canes is that they have to be placed uh, onto dirt or sand that has to be adjacent to, f uh, to water. Uh, so if I am on top of pillared sand, uh, there's no water around, uh, I can't plant sugar canes. Uh, but I can put a water source block directly onto the sand. Uh, and as long as I'm roughly over centered, the equilibrial current of the water won't push me off. Uh, essentially, I'm being pushed in all directions equally, so I'm standing still. Uh, now water is flowing over all sides of the block, uh, so water is now horizontally adjacent to the sand, uh, and the conditions to plant sugar canes now exist. So if I spam two sugar canes, uh, I've got one onto the sand and another one onto the first. Uh, and once planted, the sugar canes will displace the water, and after a few moments, water will no longer be horizontally adjacent to the sand. Uh, and so now the conditions to plant sugar canes no longer exist. Uh, but the sugar canes will stay planted until they're broken or until they receive a block, block update, which could be caused by a random block tick. Uh, so eventually they'll pop out on their own. Uh, but even if they pop out immediately, a two, blo a two block high plant will have existed until the water dissipated, and that's really all the time I need to break off a guardian attack. Uh, there they go, they just popped out. Uh, the second use for sugar canes will be as a water break. Um, sugar canes naturally grow to three blocks high, uh, and they can sometimes generate uh, four blocks high, uh, but they can be placed on top of each other to form a plant really of arbitrary height. That's a, a pretty tall high, a pretty tall sugar canes there. Um, so when I need to divide a larger room of the monument uh, so that I can uh, drain the water from the inside, all I have to do is lay down a line of sand. And then I can plant sugar canes onto the sand uh, all the way up to the ceiling, uh, no matter how tall the room is. For lighting, I have lots of torches and a stack of jack-o'-lanterns. 
Four stacks of torches is about a stack more than is strictly necessary, but you can never have too many torches. Uh, torches are broken by flowing water, but they're still good for underwater use. Torches are completely non-solid, just like sugar canes. Uh, that means that I can stand in the same block as a torch that I place on the wall or on the floor. Uh, and even though an underwater wall-mounted torch would be washed away by flowing water, it would create an air pocket long enough for me to replenish my air meter. Torches can also remove small infinite water sources. Uh, and that's because uh, blocks, including torches, can be placed faster than water updates. Uh, and uh, torches also share an, another interesting property with sugar canes in that they can be broken instantly. Uh, that means that uh, I can break torches and sugar canes uh, even while I'm under the influence of mining fatigue. Torches aren't going to help much with underwater lighting, however, because they get washed away. And due to the way in which light propagates through water, it gets dark very quickly. Uh, which makes jack-o'-lanterns essential. Jack-o'-lanterns can be placed in water. Uh, they aren't broken by flowing water. Uh, and they're actually even a little bit brighter than torches. Uh, jack-o'-lanterns also have an unusual property that I'll be using. Uh, uh, something that differentiates them from glowstone and sea lanterns. Uh, it turns out that you can't place a door on a glowstone or a sea lantern. Uh, but you can on a redstone lamp or a jack-o'-lantern. Okay, I'll also have some miscellaneous utilities and tools, uh, a chest, a crafting table that I'll use in the fourth phase of the project, uh, a couple of furnaces, and plenty of fuel. Uh, one furnace is required, two furnaces are convenient, uh, four buckets, three of which are lava buckets, uh, Technically, I only need one lava bucket. Um, three is going to save me some time, though. Uh, and since finding three lava source blocks isn't that much harder than finding one, uh, I'll stick with three. Um, a pair of shears to remove the leaf blocks after I place them. Uh, and this is where that missing stack of sand went. Uh, a quarter stack of TNT for, uh, well, fishing, I, I suppose it would be called. Uh, this is going to be my primary weapon against the Elder Guardians. TNT is a fantastic weapon uh, when underwater because it does area damage to entities without destroying any of the surrounding structure. To oversimplify the mechanics, uh, Minecraft explosions have two effects that are largely independent of one another. Uh, the blast effect harms blocks according to the blast resistance of the blocks whereas the damage effect harms entities according to the exposure of the entities. Uh, water has a really high blast resistance, but it's non-solid, so it doesn't reduce exposure, uh, which means water absorbs all of the blast effect, but none of the damage effect. Uh, when the TNT here is ignited, it's going to fall into the water and explode. Uh, the water will absorb all of the blast effect, so the ground, uh, the wall back there, and all of this fragile glass uh, none of it will break. Uh, water doesn't reduce the damage effect, however. Uh, Bessie over here is protected only by another block of non-solid water, so she'll take considerable damage. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Camilla over here is protected from the explosion by a single yet solid glass pane, uh, so she'll take just a single hit point of damage as sort of the minimum penalty for being nearby. Uh, and just to make Sure, Camilla has only uh, two hit points to begin with, uh, starting with four, three, two, sorry Camilla. Okay, here we go. And there you have it. Uh, Bessie dies, Camilla lives, and nothing was broken. Uh, so if I ignite TNT underwater and then I hide behind uh, anything solid like uh, prismarine bricks uh, like I have back here, or a door, or even glass panes. Uh, I'll be mostly protected while the guardians suffer the explosion, uh, and no blocks of the monument will be broken, which is exactly what I want. Uh, as an additional benefit, I won't be harmed by the guardians' thorns defense because I'm not dealing damage to them directly. 
Uh, and now many of the uh, other project materials have unusual properties and TNT is no exception. Uh, it turns out that TNT is one of only two cube solids that breaks instantly, uh, the other being slime blocks. So um, uh, I can break TNT even while afflicted with mining fatigue, uh, just like torches and sugarcane. So I don't have to worry about misplacing a block of TNT uh, because it's relatively easy for me to uh, break it and replace it. And last but not least, uh, I'll need just a few redstone bits in order to AFK sand dumping. Uh, I'm a novice at building redstone contraptions, so I'm eager to hear any suggested improvements. Uh, not included in the project materials are any of the basic tools I'll need throughout the project. Uh, I expect to burn through uh, 50 to 60 stone shovels, uh, 25 to 30 stone pickaxes, and 10 to 15 stone axes, uh, or the equivalent durability and better tools. Uh, and although I will be avoiding combat whenever possible, some basic armor is probably a good idea, uh, as is a sword for the occasional close-up melee. Uh, if all goes according to plan, though, uh, the only damage I'll take will be my own doing for standing too close to my TNT explosions. Uh, and that is it for the overview. Uh, in the next video, I will be killing one of the Elder Guardians in a lower wing of the monument. Uh, thanks for watching, and if you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a note in the comments.